Well, good morning. I'm going to try to get us started today. It's always difficult to do that. <clears throat> Who doesn't have notes? Okay, if you were not here last week, we are continuing with the notes from last week. So if you weren't here, you need notes. We need to we need to get started today, and uh, hopefully we'll have a few more people trickle in. It's kind of a light crowd here, but I want to start with um, the really important news, and that is that CSI, and probably most of you know this, he won the 1A 2A state cross country meet yesterday in Lebanon, Oregon. He is the only Stanfield student, male or female, do you know, for, to win the cross-country state meet. Um, although Troy Blackburn, the coach in Hermiston, still does have the record <laughs> on the board over there. <laughs> you, you still have a chance to take down some of his track records, but Troy finished second in the meet years ago. Um, so CSI has done something that no one else in Stanfield cross country history has ever done. So, so congratulations to him. All right. We are continuing with the lesson from last week, which is lesson six. And so if you weren't here, and I think I've caught most of you who were not here, but if you weren't here, Bill Porfili has uh, the notes and so you want to just pick those up and I'm going to do a just a five minute catch up last week we went through the first two items on your notes the situation today in Oregon we talked at length about that and and how a lot of what's in the Equality Act is actually in Oregon already there's been school districts Dallas School District and Sutherland School District who've both had to confront this and in both situations the state of Oregon uh, really the position was that the transgender student has all the rights and um, all other students are, are just left um, in the dark or just without rights and we, we said a lot about that that's on the if you want to know more about that you can listen to the the lesson from last week. Because that's very important, it's very interesting and very concerning. And then we talked quite a bit about what transgender activists uh, argue, their position, what they say. And I will remind you briefly of that, two quotes. One of them from last week was from Dr. Dina Atkins. And, but by the fill-in, the, the fill-in there is biology. There is one fill-in, right? That, are there two fill-ins? Okay, biology and gender uh, identity. Biology determines that biology determines sex is utterly rejected by the transgender movement. In its place, it is affirmed that gender identity determines sex. So Dr. Dina Atkins, who, if you might remember, is the professor at Duke University School of Medicine and director of the Duke Center for Child and Adolescent Gender Care, 
Quote, she argues that gender identity, these are her words, argues that gender identity is not only the preferred basis for determining sex, but the only medically supported determinant of sex. There's a medical doctor saying this, that gender identity is the only medically supported determinant of sex. Um, every other method is bad science, she claims. And again, quote, these are her words, it is counter to medical science to use chromosomes, hormones, internal reproductive organs, external genitalia, or secondary sex characteristics to override gender identity for purposes of classifying someone as male or female. And she doesn't, she doesn't say whether she applies this to dogs and That's part of the problem that we're in right now. All right, so we're going to move forward. Um, the, the third thing on your list here is the transitioning process. And so there is currently a process recommended by transgender activists for supporting a child who identifies as the opposite sex. And so this four-stage process is as follows. And the first of these would start early, very early in life. Um, Re even preschool, but certainly by, you know, kindergarten, you're into school. Social transition whereby the child is treated as the opposite sex. So social transition whereby the child is treated as the opposite sex. Well, what would that, what would that look like? I mean, I assume you can figure that out. What, what, what would that look like, do you think? Dressing. Dress, dressing would be probably the start. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so Johnny uh, feels that, you know, feels like Jamie, and so you start putting Johnny in dresses because he's identifying as female. And so, of course, you know, you have a name, you start referring to him as Jamie, and then you change pronouns so that you refer to, you know, it's she. Um, toys, yes. Um, Mm -hmm. They're girls, and they say they're married. Yeah. Well, I mean, obviously there is, there is overlap with toys, 
Although there's also, generally speaking, there are what we consider boy toys and girl toys, right? Um, so there's lots of stories of Johnny being given a, a rabbit and he turns the rabbit into a gun, you know, and he's bang, 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 bang with the rabbit. But, you know, that's not a, tr you're right, I mean, boys can play with dolls and girls can play with cars and so forth. But you, you start to treat the child as the opposite sex and that, that again, that can start very early. Number two then is puberty blockers to pre prevent normal development. And so this would be a situation where um, a parent, you know, is bought into this ideology and is treating the child as the opposite sex and, you know, puberty is approaching. So you go to someone like Dina Atkins at Duke University and, and these clinics are now popping up all over the country. And so a medical person starts to get involved and, and provide care and they prevent pu puberty from, from taking place. Now, since so much of this is pretty brand new, I think the full medical implications of that are not necessarily fully understood. Um, I'm not a medical expert, but I would think that, you know, there's a certain danger <laughs> obvious with, with this because you're, you're, you're not allowing the natural development of the child to take place. And then the next step in this is cross-sex hormones at around the age of 16. And so boys receive estrogen and girls receive uh, testosterone. And that does impede and or change, obviously, the way the body develops. And then the final stage in this would be sex reassignment surgery for those who are 18 and above. Now I'm, I'm taking this from, um, again, Ryan T. Anderson's book, which I actually brought with me today, my version of it in the three ring binder, because Amazon has banned the book. Uh, I did order two copies of the book just through snail mail in, in this form of a book because one of you asked me about it wanted to read it and so I'll have a, I'll have a couple of copies on hand if, if you're interested in that book. Any, any thoughts, Dan? Well, yes, it boggles my mind as well, and so that's why right now I'm just sort of reporting this as I did last week at greater length, because I would love it if you could answer that question for me, because you know you are the the vet, you know, you're the you're the medical person in the room. I don't know. I, I for the life of me, I cannot understand how a how an MD, MD, PhD or a professional psychologist or psychiatrist, because this also goes into counselors, of course, how they, in just a number of years, have just turned all of this upside down and backwards. In, in, and and these, are, these are people from very prestigious institutions. Of course, there, there is the other side to it. Um, Cornell University, there's a professor, Cornell had a sex reassignment program early on, back in the 70s, I believe. And the, the psychiatrist, I can't think of his name right now, who came into that role, he wasn't opposed to transgenderism, he wasn't opposed to even sex reassignment surgery, but he, he did launch some studies which showed that the results weren't really very good. I mean, I mean, emotionally, psychologically. In other words, people transitioned and it didn't solve their problems. And so Cornell actually shut down their program. Now it's been relaunched. But he would be an example of a, of a very prestigious voice 
from the medical world who's on the opposite side of this, but you know, his voice and so many others are basically being silenced is as evidenced by the fact that I, you can't download this book, even though it's an absolutely scientifically solid book. It's such a good argument. It's, it's been banned for a reason. It's such a good book, it's been banned. The truth cannot be allowed. <clears throat> Yeah, you know, and I will say this, Dan, uh, it's later in the notes, the suicide rate for transgender people is 40%. Okay, it's very high. And, and so some of this, I think, is, is some of these medical experts, I think it's based on compassion. I mean, they're, they're willing to just ignore science, and I would say ignore science, they, they would deny that, but it seems to me they're denying science, they're, they're certainly denying biology, but I think in their minds they would say, well, this is the compassionate thing to do. These people are so unhappy, they're so miserable, and so many commit suicide, we've got to do something to help them. And there's a chapter on, on genetic mutations and anomalies in, in this book. And I think, I think it's probably better to think of those as not even really, that's a different issue. Yeah. It, it really is a different issue um, than what we're talking about today. So. Yeah, yeah. which is another such an interesting piece of this because you asked why is the medical community, basically that's what you're saying, right? Why is, why is this accepted? Another just bizarre th reality is that the women's groups are by and large accepting this. So the National Organization for Women now has, has come out in support of transgender um, biological males, you know, who identify as women, and they, they're, they're women. And, and so that to me is just so hard to understand because it's, it's I think it's so undermining to, to women. It's such a threat to women, actually, in our culture. Well, let me read the next little section here because it does get into that issue. So we've looked at the transitioning process and we're, we're just trying to wrap our minds around some of this. So gender dysphoria and children. There are good reasons 
to be seriously concerned about the transgender affirmative approach to treating gender dysphoria in children, starting with the fact that it encourages and promotes a child's false assumption about their sex. Now you realize, of course, based on what I've been sharing with you, how controversial that subject is. What I just said. I just said the false assumption about their sex. So a little boy who says or feels like he's a little girl, I'm saying that's false. That's contrary to biology. Our culture will say that that's a transphobic comment. I've just become a bigot by saying that. That's really where we're at. Um, he, it diminishes the chances that a child will naturally grow out of gender discordant of a gender dis discordant stage, as the vast majority otherwise do. All competent authorities agree that between 80 to 95 percent of children who say that they are transgender naturally come to accept their sex and to enjoy emotional health by late adolescence. And one of the sources of this is that uh, professor from Cornell University. And that statement was part of an amicus brief before the United States Supreme Court in early 2017 for ongoing cases involving gender identity policies in schools. But that's, that's a recognized statistic of 80 to 95 percent of children who at some point um, state that there's gender dysphoria, you know, in their lives, they do outgrow it. And gender dysphoria is confusion, right? That's what that means. So a young person goes to a school counselor or their parents, you'd hope they go to their parents, right, and say, I, I, I feel some sense of confusion as to whether I'm boy, a boy or a girl. And so this this, of course, happens, but 80 to 95 percent of children will grow out of that if they are not pushed in the wrong direction. Okay, so there's a real danger here of, of now just accepting what that child says and affirming it and pushing that child in a direction that, you know, won't be good for their future life. Okay. So that is why a, a number of researchers who are actually quite open to transgenderism as an ideology are opposed to um, the ideology as it concerns young children. Okay. Well, I would consider it contrary to nature and contrary to God's created intent. And I would consider it dangerous and, and unhealthy for kids. Um, I'm not an expert on brainwashing, but I think that a child who, who comes to an adult or to a parent and says, I've, I've got some of these issues, that the parent should, needs to understand that in 80 to 95% of the cases, the child will outgrow it. And so what should the approach be? It, should it be to encourage this or should it be to help the child accept their biological sex? And the transgender movement is saying, basically, don't help the child accept their biological sex. Let's, let's push this agenda. So did, did, did a hand go up? Yeah, and that's, that's, that's in the next room. <laughs> that's the text for today, right? <laughs> but so yes, I mean, that, that's an interesting verse, isn't it? And, you know, we're living in times where it does seem like, I mean, we just scratch our heads. How can people think these thoughts? These thoughts are so contrary to what's scientific, what's logical, and yet they would say you're being unscientific and illogical. Researchers have found that a young child's gender identity is both, their words, elastic and plastic. 
It can change over time and it responds to outside forces, including the approval and disapproval of parents, as well as messages received from the broader culture. This means that transgender affirming treatments may cause some children to persist in a transgender identity when they would have otherwise grown to accept their natal sex. Those children may then go on to subject themselves to unnecessary surgeries and ongoing hormonal treatments. And so this is one reason why some therapists who do not oppose transition treatment in general still think it's a bad idea for children. So I, I, I think that the real, the, the part of our population that we should be most concerned about in all of this would be young children. You know, if you've got a 45-year-old man who says, comes out of the closet and says, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a woman and I want to have sex reassignment surgery, I'm not in favor of that, but I do see that as a different issue than a five-year-old boy or girl who is having a struggle in this area. And it seems to me that whether you're a Christian or a non-Christian or wherever you are on this spectrum, it would seem to me that we could all agree that we, you should try to support that child to affirm their biological sex. But that's not where we're at as a culture. You may have covered this, but both is transgenderism or issues in Roman times or Middle Ages, for instance? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, I think that I'm not very knowledgeable about this, but I do know that in the New Testament, I think it's in, I don't, have, I don't want to take the time for this, it's 1 Corinthians 6 maybe, where is that text? Well, it's, it's on, um, 1 Corinthians 6, 9, says sexual immoral idolaters adulterers nor men who practice homosexuality it might be that word i'm trying to remember here there there is in the new testament a word used and we would probably translate it as homosexual but the word is more precise than that and and the word refers to the the soft homosexual or the homosexual who's fulfilling the woman's role. Okay, so the Romans had words to describe these things. You know, so if you've got two men and they're two gay men, still, you know, one of them is going to end up playing the role of the female in, in the sex act, right? I mean, it's as sick as, it, we can say that, right? That's pretty, it's pretty sick. But there's a word for that, the soft partner. And so they were certainly aware of these things because they have, they have language to describe it. Um, I also mentioned a couple of weeks ago that when the Emperor Nero, that he, he took a young boy and had the boy castrated and made the boy his wife. Now that's not exactly transgenderism because the boy, I'm assuming, didn't want this done to him, but that's Nero you know, operating in that kind of a way. There's always probably been cross-dressers. So, but what I think is interesting is that when you as a culture begin to affirm these things, I really do think that I'm not at all surprised that you have people just sort of coming out of the woodwork now who are identifying as transgender or lesbian or non-binary or gender fluid and we see this at the school here particularly among young girl or young women high school age girls and and I think that it's become it's become kind of popular and and it's become so accepted and, and you're sort of a you're a heroine or a hero if you affirm this or come out this way and so I, I think it's I think it's um, our culture is actually creating more and more of this.
-hmm. Yeah, and that was just like, that's just very recent. Anybody know more about that? So I read about that. I don't, I don't remember the particulars, but, but there was another state where they passed, the legislature passed um, a, a, a kind of, you know, what we call an anti-transgender bill, or I would say maybe a supportive children's bill. The governor vetoed it, and then the legislature overturned the governor's veto. So there's, there's, is that Arkansas? Okay. So there's, there's several of these, and obviously they're going to eventually get to the Supreme Court, and then we'll see what happens. All these things eventually will go to the Supreme Court. Okay. All right. Anderson, in his book, um, he has a number of transition stories that are tragic, and, and that's very interesting. So it's important to, to note that transition stories abound, and many of them are tragic. I mean, in a sense, all of them are tragic, right? Who is it? Uh, what's the name of the young actress? Ellen Page, who's now Elliot Page. Have you, you know what I'm talking about? You'd, you'd recognize her if you Googled Ellen Page. She's been in a number of, uh, she was in the movie Juno, I think. Very pretty young woman, and she's now transitioned to a man. So, I mean, to me, that's, all of this is tragic. But um, even for those who do transition, many report that the underlying problems that led them to transition, depression, anxiety, bodily discomfort, they don't go away. Not surprisingly, transgender activists rarely talk about or even acknowledge these realities. So they don't want you to know that there are folks who you know, go all the way through this process, including surgery, and then they, it, it doesn't solve the underlying issues, and, and they're still anxious and depressed and, at, and not at peace. Because of this crap. So. 
Yeah, and you've brought up several things, um, you know, gender reveal parties. Usually, though, those are, that's a phenomena that's, that's new. And at, as my understanding, it's a positive thing. Yeah. You know, it's, it, but it is new. It's like you've got all these elaborate, you know, you, so you have a baby and, and someone hires um, one of these planes that has the flag or the message behind it. And it says, it's a girl or it's a boy. And in the past, I would have said, that's just sort of narcissistic, you know. I mean, you're just making such a big deal out of the birth of your child. Or uh, Zion Williams, the basketball player, a couple of years ago, someone on the Duke, one of the Duke coaches or trainers got Zion Williams to dunk. I'm trying to remember this now. He dunked something, and is it, maybe he squoze it when he dunked it, but it, it like opened up and it was blue or pink confetti that fell to the floor. And so this family had had an ultrasound, the wife had, had an ultrasound, and so she is announcing to the world that they're having a boy or a girl. That's kind of a new thing. And, and I think that that's actually, in some strange way, a positive thing. Because it's affirming that biology does matter, okay? The other thing that is that stimulated a thought with what you said is just, just with Title IX, and you know, Title IX has to do with women's and women in sports and women in the workplace, and so many of these civil rights laws, as we've said in the past, are being redefined. So when Title IX was passed, you know, a woman meant a biological woman. The authors of Title IX did not have transgenderism in view when they wrote that legislation. legislation. But now what's happening with all these, these civil rights laws is that in the past it was like we're protecting uh, religious liberty and we're protecting women and we're, we're, we're speaking about race. And those are the two big ones, right? You know, race and feminism. But now they've added without any warrant, and they've actually gone against the intent of these laws to add a new understanding of what it means to be a woman. So that you can be a, bio a biological male, but be a woman. So anyway. <laughs> Yes. So you're talking about a different thing, yeah. but but yes, uh, coming out of the closet or, or yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That big fire in California last year, the year before, that was how it got started. It said it was a gender reveal, and I was thinking, you know, husband, wife, kid. No, it was a yeah. gender transitioning reveal. Oh, was that really? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Interesting. All right, so the, the, next, the next piece here, if you, if you take the time to read Anderson's book, this, this was the thing that was most helpful to me. So this was, you know, when you read a book, if you, get, if you can take one big idea away from a book, that's a book worth reading, it seems to me. And, and this was the big idea that helped me. You know, how should we think about transgenderism? You know, we know how the activists think about it. We've been discussing that, that sex is just determined what, between what's between your ears. But Anderson is suggesting, along with others, that we think of transgenderism as a psychological disorder, okay? So there's a fill in there, right? Transgenderism is a, is a psychological disorder. Now again, you, you know, you might say, well, your, your response might be, well, no, duh. But, you know, if you say that, boy, that's, in our culture, that is really transphobic. That's highly inappropriate. Well, let me read some of this. Um, we must respond to transgender people with compassion. The rate of attempted suicide among those who identify as transgender is over 40%. So clearly people who struggle with gender dysphoria face deep 
psychological issues. Now, I agree with those who define transgenderism as a psychological disorder, so I want to read to you Ryan Anderson at length. Many psychologists and psychiatrists think of gender dysphoria as similar to other dysphorias or forms of profound discomfort with one's body. The feelings of discomfort can lead to mistaken beliefs about oneself or about reality and then to actions in accordance with those false beliefs. Dr. McCuff, this is the man from Cornell University, if I'm pronouncing his name right, says that people who identify as transgender suffer a disorder of assumption. Like those in other dis like those in other disorders familiar to psychiatrists. So a disorder of assumption, they're assuming something. The, the disordered assumption of those who identify as the opposite sex, he says, is similar to the faulty assumption of those who suffer with anorexia nervosa, who believe themselves to be overweight when in fact they are dangerously thin. Dr. Josephin describes the phenomenon as a delusion, which in psychiatry refers to a fixed false belief, which is held despite clear evidence to the contrary. So a delusion, a psychological definition, this is from the experts, is a fixed false belief, which is held despite clear evidence to the contrary. But it was helpful for me when I read that to think that, you know, how, how should we think about this? Well, that anorexia would be a reasonable analogy to think about when, when you consider transgenderism. Because w what's at the heart of anorexia? What's that? Yeah, and there's just, I mean, a person who struggles with anorexia is utterly convinced that they are overweight when, in fact, they are dangerously thin. And, of course, anorexia, we associate that with women. I assume that there are men who struggle with that as well. I don't know what the percentage breakdown is. I don't know a lot about anorexia. Yeah, so in extreme cases, you know, a person struggling with anorexia, they, they look a little bit like a concentration camp victim, you know, coming out of the Second World War, and yet they insist that they're not on the verge of starvation and profoundly unhealthy and just a skeleton walking around. They, they insist that they're overweight. And, and Maria, I think, is right. It, it has to do with control. It has to do with a lot of psychological issues that are, you know, profoundly distorted. And they're, they are believing something which is profoundly untrue. And, and, and to think that transgenderism, if we're going to put into a category, we're, we're not giving an explanation, right? Not really, as to why people are this way. And there's probably a lot of reasons for that, and quite frankly, science, scientists don't have any unanimous opinion on this. In, in Anderson's book, you know, he talks to a number of people who have struggled in this way and, and talks about their past. And, and in many situations, there are things that happen to these people uh, that have played a role. And, and perhaps there are some even biological issues. You know, we, we, we are part of a really broken world. And, and that brokenness will express itself in a thousand and one different ways. So I'm not trying to give a scientific explanation, but just how we should think about this from a psychological perspective. It does seem to me that those sorts of dysphoria issues that, that there isn't any question about or conflict about or controversy over so if you have someone with anorexia, well, what should be your response, would you think? Should you accept that and say, well, 
This is your identity, so you've got an anorexic identity, so we're going to just accept that. I mean, I'd, we wouldn't say that, right? Well, but if they're going to be logical, they have to. Yes, if they're going to be logical, they would have to. I mean, a less controversial way of stating this is that if I announce today that I'm a black man, that you have to accept that because my, my skin doesn't show it, but between my ears, I'm black. Of course, that, that has happened, the gal in Spokane, you know, who worked for the NAACP, and she was a white woman, and she passed as black, and, and the culture, when that was discovered, she was utterly condemned. But it's, an, it's a total inconsistency to condemn her. Because if we accept this, why, why not accept those other things? So I agree with you, but we still have sanity in those issues and not in this issue. But I think it's helpful. It was helpful to, for me to put this in a category. So if I'm dealing with someone who's transgender, you know, how, how should I respond to that? Well, I think I should respond to it the way I would respond to someone with, with a disorder like anorexia and recognize that there's a profound distorted thinking process going on here concerning their body. And so how do I help with that? Well, you know, as a counselor, you should actually try to help a person to accept um, their body, you know, in, in a healthy way. Okay? Uh, so let me keep reading. Someone who becomes subject to a, dis to a delusion or a disordered assumption may at first be aware of harboring feelings that are not in line with reality. But over time, these feelings generate an alternative reality in their own minds. Some people with anorexia, for instance, may initially feel overweight, but no, they are not. So they struggle with their mistaken feelings until the feelings overwhelm them and they come to believe that they are actually fat and this belief governs their actions. Likewise, some people with gender dysphoria feel as if they are the opposite sex but know they are not so they struggle with their feelings until the feelings overwhelm them and they come to identify as the opposite sex and they act accordingly. Now, there's another disorder called body integrity disorder. Have you ever heard of that? I had never heard of this. It's uh, B-I-I-D, body integrity disorder. Such people have fully functional bodies but believe they are disabled. And so in extreme cases, seek surgical amputation to bring their bodies into conformity with their inner identity feelings. So there are actually reported instances of a person who, for instance, says, I can't walk, and it's confined to a wheelchair, but there's nothing wrong with them. They're capable of walking, and such people actually have wanted a surgery to, to sever their spinal cord in order to you know, have their, their identity conform to their feelings. Or a person who says, you know, my, I've got this arm, but it's not there, and they want their arm amputated to bring their mind into conformity with how they see their body. And again, based on your responses as I'm watching you, um, you, you would say that is, that there is no way that we should recognize that and treat those people just based upon what's between their ears, right? They have a thought that I want my body mutilated because I feel like I don't have a right arm or I'm confined to a wheelchair. It's basically compassion to help a person understand. Yes. There's nothing wrong with your legs. Yes. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
and we believe that people who are in the forefront of this movement to say have surgery for children that is not compassionate and that is not the loving thing to do and that is not the right thing to do and and we we can't just remain silent on this and say that um, that's a kind, compassionate approach. You know, we're going to get into this subject in coming weeks, but one of the reasons that we should be adamantly opposed to gay marriage is that every child, every child has a right to a mother and a father. And we should stand on that. And so if you have two lesbians and they go to the sperm bank and they get a donation and they make a child to fulfill some need within them, our response should be, that is not right because that child has now become a victim of their actions. Because that child has a right to a father. And how dare you take that from that child? I mean... That is not a hateful thing to say. That is a compassionate thing to say. So part of the issue in some of this is like children's rights. And, and in some areas, children's, you know, to, to, to go through this sexual transition, I, I don't think children should have this right. But, but there is something called children's rights, and, and that should be factored into some of these things. Children are often the victims. There are victims in all of this. Women are the victims of the transgender movement. In so many of these issues, children are the victims of, of, of people who are reordering society. I hasten to add here that, you know, and we've got people in the room that, you know, maybe you were not blessed to grow up in a family with a father and a mother. And we recognize that, and we recognize that, you know, we do the best we can given the, the set of circumstances. And we want to be compassionate to everybody who, who had some sort of struggle or disadvantage in that way. But we should, we should recognize that, and all the medical science shows this, that a child does best in a nuclear family with a father and a mother. And so that we should value that. And that's not being a Bible thumper to say that. So, all right, well, I'll stop there and just um, any feedback. I don't think we'll go any farther than the notes today. We'll finish this next week. But just any, we've got about five minutes, so if there's any feedback or questions or, yeah, Lloyd? I, I think it's the CDC that I'm going to add. I just noticed it the last week. If you listen to it, it's the CDC that's going to make the decision. If you listen to it, it's a lady talking and then she refers to her wife and their child. And it's all about self safe. And, you know, that's the government putting out. They're just going to start doing this stuff over and over and over. And I think it's out of proportion to the reality of what we've been talking about. Most people say that these kind of situations are one to three to five percent of the population. <clears throat> we're hearing it in such a way that you would think that every other person is in some dysphoria. Yeah. Mm hmm. So what you're talking about, Lloyd, in part, you know, the traditional language, and this is really coming, I think, more from the Roman Catholic Church, but it's a really helpful category of dis the category of disordered desires. That, and we all can understand this. In various ways, we all have disordered desires. You know, we, we want things we shouldn't want. We feel things we shouldn't feel. And because of the rise of autonomy within our culture, you know, that everyone is just a law unto themselves, disordered desires are, are now just, they're not considered disordered anymore. You know, if you feel it, you should pursue it. 
And that category is really important, I think, to hold on to from a Christian worldview perspective, that just because you have a desire, it's not right. And so many of our desires are disordered, and that's just a reality of living in a Genesis 3 post world. You know, we are sinful creatures, and we don't understand where some of our desires come from. And then, you know, you're right. I mean, not everybody, I think that this has been overmade because it's become popular and, and they're pushing an agenda. The other thing that we should think about is the fact that live birth abortions could get to the point that we didn't want that way. So let's go ahead and do the live birth abortion. And I don't think that's far from where we're at now. There's already Yeah, is that might be is that Peter Sanger? Yeah, I wanted to say his name, but I wasn't sure. If if that's him, I mean, he teaches at Harvard. So many of these, so many of these folks, so many of these folks though do teach at places like Harvard. You know, by the way, there is now a, a new city ordinance in Cambridge, Massachusetts, that's that's affirmed plural marriage. Plural marriage. So of polygamy of various sorts. So, so that actually is coming and it's, it's starting at the level of cities, certain really left cities, but it's going to continue to come. But again, it's associated with an Ivy League school. Yeah. There's like 1,500 that want to do it, but they're waiting in the process to go through it. And you know as well as I do what the deal is there. Yes. And again, that's where women are being victimized. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, as I sit here and listen to all this, it's, <clears throat> as you're trying to deal with the transgender, it's no different than dealing with people who believe that any roads lead to God. I mean, it's a spiritual issue. If you're trying to convince somebody that Jesus died for their sin, well, I'm not a sinner. It, it's no different. I mean, it's a spiritual issue all the way through. Mm -hmm. and, and we have to deal with them just like anybody else. That needs to be saved. And only the gospel can do that. Yeah, if you, res if you reject the category of disordered desires, what are you doing? You're rejecting the category of sin. That's what you're doing. Because a disordered desire is just a way of expressing a sinful desire that not all desires are, are right. Just because you feel something, it's not right. And we all, we all acknowledge this at some level, but that's just falling away on so many of these different issues. Whatever I feel is right. Your last one, we gotta. 